change has affected everyone. Now, it's no surprise that the last decade has now been declared the warmest on record. And that warning, warming trend is likely to continue. But just how will this impact us down here in southern Africa? With me is climate change ex expert Bob Scholes, professor of systems ecology at Wits University and director of, Glo of the Global Change Institute. Good professor, morning. thank you so much for coming in this morning. Uh, we watch uh, or look forward to a film of Sir David Attenborough coming out. But those are the things that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The numbers are there. The numbers are not lying. Uh, a report being released by NASA and two other big organizations this week. We're coming out of the warmest decade on record. The past five years on average being one degree Celsius warmer compared to pre-industrial times. Now, a, a layman would look at that and say, one degree, what, what does that mean? But in the greater scheme of things, that's a very big difference, isn't it? So the interesting thing about this past year is, in fact, we've gone beyond the numbers. You know, we've been dealing with numbers professionally for the last three decades, saying the world's warming up, the world's warming up, and it's very hard to grasp. Mm. But just in this last year, I have bumped into so many people with climate change stories, not numbers, mm. experiences, farmers who've had to give up their farms, people who have migrated from one town to another because they just can't stand the high temperatures. So yes, the numbers do absolutely underscore what's going on there, but it's now become very tangible. You don't need numbers to mm. look at massive, you know, felt fires raging across the country or to look at the anguish of people who are suffering from day zero as they have been in the Eastern Cape. For, for the last several months. Uh, you also just have to watch the news, really, especially if we bring you updates on world events around the world. Just this week as well, uh, we've had the uh, Global Risks Report come out from the World Economic Forum. And for the first time, the top five uh, of the annual uh, risks expected to be the focus this year are environmentally uh, connected. It's extreme weather events, failure of climate change mitigation and adaption, climate change and massive biodiversity loss, major natural disasters, human-made environmental damage and disasters. And that's the World Economic Forum uh, saying that something needs to be done and it needs to be done like yesterday. Um, is there any hope that now that we're seeing um, undoubtable evidence, anecdotally and scientifically, that change will be made where it's needed most? So technically, we can still avoid the worst consequences that we are potentially facing. You know, this is like a, a super tanker. It takes mm -hmm. a certain amount of time to turn. And so even if we do do what it needs to be done starting immediately we're going to see more climate change than we're currently experiencing um, but if we don't do anything literally in the next couple of years then the future that we face is actually in some respects unadaptable to in other words we will face severe losses much much greater than the uh, economic pain of adaptation at this stage. Now, Professor Richard Washington from NASA was quoted widely this week when they re released their report, and I think he does have a South African connection as well. An African uh, connection. Indeed. Uh, uh, now, he says that Africa is expected to be hardest hit by climate change because it's more vulnerable, because we have millions of people that depend very closely on rainfall uh, to grow their food. Talk to us about why a focus on Africa is very important as we try and turn this big tanker ship, as you say, around? So there's really three reasons, and our vulnerability in the adaptation sense is only one of them. So people tend to look at Africa and say, you know, these governments just don't have the mm. adaptive capacity to do what's needed. That's partly true, but remember that because governments in Africa uh, have been poor at that kind of intervention, people do it themselves. And so at the personal level and at the village level, let's say, Africa is actually fabulously adaptive. So we, we need to bear that in, in mind. But the other reasons why Africa is at risk is because of our geographical location astride the tropics, mm. we actually see some of the worst of climate change. So you mentioned a statistic earlier that the world has warmed up by one degree above pre-industrial. In most parts of the African continent, including southern Africa, in the interior, we're actually, for one degree global, we're seeing somewhere in excess of two degrees locally. Mm. And that's 
just because of the climatic location uh, that we that we sit in. So, so that will. If we, I, I, I like the bringing in the idea of what effect it has on village level. Um, uh, what effect then does that have? Uh, it, it, it then changes what people grow, at what time of year they can grow it, when they can expect rainfall, and the list goes on. All of that has already changed. Mm. If you speak to anyone who's growing crops almost anywhere uh, in Africa, they will tell you the rains don't come when they used mm. to come. We've had to change from this to that, etc. But we should also remember that during the 21st century, the time that this will really unfold in, Africa is rapidly, rapidly urbanizing, far faster than any continent has ever done before. Mm -hmm. So although our rural concerns are very real and important, we also have to think about how will the new cities which are popping up deal with this? How will they deal with water supplies and energy supplies? And that is a concern. It's also an opportunity because most of those urban locations don't yet exist. Mm -hmm. So we can design them. And you know that means that we can pre-adapt to some degree, not only in how we deal with a higher temperature future, but also how we design our living spaces and our industries so that they are less climate damaging. We have those choices. We don't have to go into more coal-fired power stations for the future. We have an opportunity now to actually bypass that and go into renewables. Now there's a big focus on what uh, can be done on a wider scale from governments uh, around the world. On a local level in South Africa, what would you like to see being done in terms of policy and indeed action from the South African government uh, to make sure that we are ready for these changes that are already upon us? Yes, you make a very good distinction there because the South African policies with respect to climate change and with respect to things like water and energy, mm. which are some of the critical issues, are actually excellent. They're world class. Mm. The gap comes out w between what we say and, and what we do. So I would like to see uh, policies, for instance, in the energy sector, which are much more forward-looking uh, than, than backward-looking. Same in uh, issues such as transport. You know, we uh, have uh, basically um, reduced the importance of things like rail in the country to a, a, a bit player, whereas it ought to be one of the major players and get, you know, the big trucks and the cars off the road, Im improved uh, public transport for, for many reasons improved urban design, get away from this template that we inherited from the apartheid state of Indeed. where you live in one place and work 30, 40 kilometers away. These are things that we need to do and which will have many benefits other than improved climate change. Absolutely. And you would think that, that the, uh, the politicians will see the political benefit of that in terms of improving uh, the electorate's lives. Um, I, it, it brings me to a quote from the World Economic Forum president earlier this week. He says, the political landscape is polarized, sea levels are rising and climate fires are burning. This is the year when world leaders must work with all sectors of society to repair and reinvigorate our systems of cooperation, not just for the short-term benefit, but for tackling our deep-rooted risks. But it's easier said than done because we need uh, political leaders, uh, if you think outside of just South Africa, um, and you look at your, your big players like the U.S. in Europe and the likes, and Australia, as we see now, to make very difficult uh, decisions that might not be politically popular right now. Yes, I think that we're just past a defining moment. For mm. instance, in Australia, they had an election only, what, uh, 12 months ago or something like that. And in fact, climate change was one of the two top issues on the table. So their current government scraped in. I don't think it'll survive mm. another uh, election with its, its climate change record. And although we all like to look at the United States and say, well, you know, they showing a failure of leadership mm -hmm. in, in, in this area. I suspect that climate change is going to be one of the defining issues in the upcoming presidential uh, election. So from being a, something on the periphery that was ignorable, mm -hmm. we're getting to the stage where people are seeing so much of this in their lives and it's worrying them so much that it's hard to just sweep it away and say, no, guys, you know, it's just the economy that matters or it's just that it matters or whatever. Does this bring to the fore the importance of the next generation, the young people that are growing up learning about this in their school curriculums, uh, thankfully? Uh, uh, we've seen a character like Greta Thunberg uh, becoming uh, an international newsmaker, but the uh, denialists or perhaps the more conservatives are saying, 
oh, but you're making young people and children worry unnecessarily. You're creating anxiety where it's not needed. Uh, but I beg to think that if the young people don't panic, who will? Yeah, exactly. And I think that there's a parallel here in South African political history. You know, who was it who triggered the final fall of apartheid? It Absolutely. was the young people. And because when you're looking at the time horizons that we're looking at, it really is their life. It's not my life here mm. that's going to be impacted. The other unlikely player in this is the financial sector. You know, we would think that response to climate change would be, for instance, by the energy sector. They're the guys who, you know, producing a lot of the emissions, etc. In fact, the first movers have been finance houses because they have to make investments with a 30-year time horizon. And so within their institutional lives, if you like, they seeing this big risk. And that's why we're getting people like the CEO of BlackRock saying we are no longer going to make investments mm. in things which are, have climate risk exposure. And those kinds of things need to matter more. Uh, we, we live in a world where we're bombarded by fake news and people spend far more time on Facebook than even watching mainstream news channels uh, such as ours. Uh, if somebody's watching now saying yes but how do I know what's true? Where should I be going to educate myself if I'm not in school where they're teaching this? Mm. What would your suggestion be? The answer to that is a tough one because it applies not only to climate change but to all kinds of fake news. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I teach my own students how to distinguish between what is a reliable piece of information and what is fluff, I, I give them a number of rules. You know, firstly, who's saying this? Do they mm -hmm. have the credentials? Do they perhaps have a vested interest? Um, is what they're saying, does it actually make coherent sense in relation to what we know about the basic physics? Does it make sense in relation to our experience? Uh, and, and you add up all of those things and say, no, I trust this piece of information and not that bit of information. Great advice there. Thank you so much. Professor Bob Scholes, a real education, that conversation. Professor of Systems Ecology at Wits University and Director of the Global Change Institute. Thank you so much for your time and uh, bringing us your expertise this My morning. Pleasure. Well, that's it from me. Weekend.